from a confirmed physician to a glycobiologist, how come? I'm sometimes asked. I was a graduate from the Royal Free Hospital Medical School. After house jobs, I gained a fellowship for a year's spell in hematology, originally intended to prepare me to return as a physician uh, to my homeland, Cyprus, where congenital hemoglobinopathies are common. My idea and job description for the fellowship was to be a clinical link for referrals to the hematology department at Hammersmith Hospital. The professor agreed initially, but at start time, a pair of hands was needed, it seems. I was to be a, a rotating registrar, a resident in hematology. It would be good for me, he said. This was a breach of confidence, a breach of promise then, breach of promise. Well, my mentor, Professor Sheila Sherlock, said, take it, others would want it. So this was a, a point of no return. And in the course of the rotating ship, I encountered cases of atypical pneumonia, atypical pneumonia with red cell cold agglutinins, just as in chronic cold agglutinin disease and occasional hemolytic anemia. The infective agents had recently been established to be mycoplasma pneumonia. The antibodies were called anti-I to the I antigen of red cells. The structure of I antigen was unknown, nor was the structure of the little I, no, the little I that developmentally changes into the large I antigen from fetal to adult cells. That was not known either. But this seemed a great example of an autoimmune disorder triggered by an infective agent. I thought I'd take a little time to look at this. But I needed a bench. Well, I got two job offers, one from the Brompton Chest Hospital and another from Imperial Cancer Research Fund, Dr. Negroni. Now, why? Well, there was hot news. A link was suggested between viruses and leukemias. Negroni had isolated what he thought were viruses from leukemias, but in fact, these turned out to be mycoplasmas. But it turned out to be that the mycoplasma, one of them was the pulmonis, a culture tissue contaminant to rodents. The other, a human commensal fermentas, likely from mouth pipetting. These were distinct from the human respiratory pathogen, mycoplasma pneumonia. And here is an EM of the mycoplasma pneumonia with its chip tip attaching to the ciliated epithelial cells in a tracheal organ culture. Yes, I needed a job. Sheila said, bring it here. Okay, I went there. Mycoplasma pneumonia became a reportable disease in the UK. And Ten Fazy as an associate of Sheila Sherlock became a recipient of the list of reported cases from the public health laboratory. And the Dr. Hector McLean was a GP reporting many cases of mycoplasma pneumonia in Lockerbie area of Dumfrieshire in Scotland. Why aren't you there already, said Sheila. So Ten Fazy became a commuter to Lockerbie. Well, in 1965, we published our first report on mycoplasma respiratory infections. And we reported the cases of undoubted or probable recent infection had a positive Coombs test. This is the antiglobulin test indicative of antibodies to red cells. And although overt hemolytic anemia, anemia did not occur, um, there was 
reticulocytosis compatible with a low-grade hemolytic disorder. And this persisted, in fact, in as late as the 50th week after onset of infection. And the blood film from a typical case with a titer of 256 of 4 degrees, 100 of 256 of cold agglutinin theta, showed leukocyte agglutination, granulocyte, mixtures of granulocytes, lymphocytes, or lymphocytes in addition to red cell at ambient, and these dispersed at 37 degrees. However, anti-I were not directed at the mycoplasma. However, they could be elicited experimentally. Production of cold agglutinins was achieved by immunizing rabbits with human red cells treated with mycoplasma pneumonia. And the antibodies were monoclonal. And here's the way we determined this by the Uchtaloni test, anti-IgM, anti-Kappa. They were IgM, Kappa monoclonals, and they resembled the IgM antibodies of chronic autoimmune hemolytic disease, all were known to be IgM Kappa, not Lambda at that stage. But when I found a new case of chronic cold agglutinin disease with Lambda anti-I, you could send this to science for publishing. So here is uh, the new case, anti-I, with anti-lambda precipitin line, but not with anti-kappa, whereas a typical case was with anti-kappa. Yes, published in science. A letter came from Henry Kunkel, the king of immunology at Rockefeller University. I had beaten him to it. He, they already had just discovered a case of lambda chain cold agglutinins. Well, encouraged by this interaction, I applied for a research fellowship from the MRC and got one to spend with Henry Kunkel at Rockefeller University. But a bit of a space problem arose in the Kunkel lab. Well, I was loaned to Richard Krause an expert in streptococcal polysaccharides who was raising antibodies, monoclonal antibodies in rabbits to the streptococci. I was actually in quarantine myself, transferred later, it was because I was a woman. Um, Krause instructed me on polysaccharide extraction procedures, which I applied to extract eye antigen active substance from human milk. And I'm really forever grateful to Richard for training me in this. The fluffy white substance I isolated, four milligrams of it from a liter of milk, looked like carbohydrate and it reversibly precipitated in the cold with anti-IMA, one of the antibodies here as it is in the center, extracts from milk. At 37, the precipitants disappeared and they reappeared at 40 degrees. Well, who better to consult than Professor Elvin Cabot, the father of blood group antigens, across town at Columbia Medical Center. Elvin Cabot listened to me and he said, bring it here. We will train you up. And in the Cabot lab, here I was, we were required as a part of intensive training to calibrate the Lang-Levi pipettes was the type I was using, these high precision pipettes. This was to learn how to weigh, etc. Well, tut tut, mouth pipetting, but within a short time, I introduced Ependol pipettes, a Cabot lab, but we had to wash the tips in that lab. My substance was rich in galactose and n acetylglosamine with a little n acetylgalactosamine consistent with an O-glycan rich mucin type glycoprotein of the, type of, of the type that Cabot was using to map out O-glycans with blood group A, B, A and Lewis antigen activities released from the abundantly available ovarian cyst glycoproteins. And this was the state of play with Cabot's proposal of the composite 
megalosaccharide structure showing the interrelationships of the blood group A, the B, the Fucose, for the H, and Lewis A, Lewis B antigens. And the precursor chains, the backbone chains I'm illustrating here. One of the glycoproteins, OG 20%, 2X precipitated twice in ethanol, lacking the ABH, Lewis antigens, and containing the precursor chains was bound by various monoclonal anti-I. This was my first paper with Caput, his 47th in the blood group series. There were specificity differences among the monoclonals, anti-I, the structure of one of the determinants for one anti-I, anti-IMA I mentioned earlier, was established as an oligosaccharide fragment. And here it is. The sequence was gal 14 glicnac beta 16 gal or galnac as we later showed, the branch point of the backbone structure. We could classify the anti-I on the basis of their binding with the blood group substances and the precursor substances, but there were insufficient amounts of glycans to identify the determinants. So back in London, I took the matter by the horn, as I say, and in a transatlantic collaboration with Sen Hakumori, we studied red cell glycolipids, red cell glycolipids to elucidate the eye the large eye and the small eye antigen. And there was a pact, no fax, no FedEx, only short notes, no letters from secretaries. We had to move fast. And within a couple of years of looking at diverse glycolipids he was extracting and fractionating from cells, he sent to us, we analyzed them, sent back news. Within a couple of years, we established the structures of the large eye and the small eye antigens uh, as being of the type two backbones, the large eye being the branch structure, small eye, the unbranched structure. But of course, these were monoclonals and we looked at the different ones from different patients. There was anti-IMA, which I mentioned, type one. Type two was anti-I-STEP, uh, preferring this one three backbone, but just with a part of the branch. And the type three anti-IP requiring the entire uh, I sequence for binding. So these being extremely powerful immunochemical, immunochemic uh, sequencing reagents, we use them and they are indeed unrivaled to this day. We looked at the expression of these blood group I active carbohydrate sequences on cultured human and animal cell lines with Bob Childs, my colleague, and were really very remarkable differences we found in the presence of the various I determinants, large I and small I, in individual cells within established cell lines. Very remarkable shown by the shading, the strong, the moderate, and the weak, and the lack of binding. So the take home message was that a glycoprotein extract from a given cell line, even an established cell line, will harbor a heterogeneous population of glycoforms with differing site-specific glycosylation. We looked with Martin Evans, Nobel laureate since that time, to the expression of the changes and the polarization of blood group antigens in post-implantation mouse embryos and teratocarcinomas associated with differentiation. Just a section from one of uh, from our study, but I'm going to summarize shortly the, sal the uh, salient findings. But the era of hybridomas came to developmentally regulated and tumor associated antigens. And I was at the receiving end of these. And among them came anti-SSEA1, antibody to the stage specific embryonic antigen of the mouse. And with Martin Evans, 
uh, we showed that this antigen, which appears just at compaction stage when the cell-cell interactions first occur, was the Lewis X sequence on a large eye, small eye type backbone. And here is the uh, image of the diagram I promised. At the one to four cell stage, there was large eye antigen on the mouse embryonic cell. At the compaction stage, SSEA appears with the addition of a fucose residue. And when the primitive endoderm was formed, the little eye antigen appeared. So the changes of antigenicities of glycoproteins and glycolipid cells during successive developmental stages, we thought may be brought about by sequential addition or perhaps even deletion of monosaccharide residues. And I did an article for Tibbs and reported and commented on our studies um, and uh, the way they showed some changing antigenicities and during successive stages and said what I have just said in the picture I showed. And I chose to say that the term area code molecule could be well applied to cell surface carbohydrates, in which case lectins, like carbohydrate binding antibodies and enzymes, um, they would become ideal candidates for roles as postmen, policemen, and traffic sites involved in the obedient interpretation of the area codes. But then many monoclonal hybridoma antibodies came by and two were against myeloid cells, the EP8, the EP9. They also were recognizing the Lewis X related sequence, but slight differences in fine specificity. But as like anti-SSEA, they bound to the granulocytes, they bound to the murine embryonic cells. And then antibodies to a human fetal endoderm defined by another antibody called FC Pendo2. This turned out to be the type one backbone sequence, isomer of the little i antigen. Colonic adenocarcinoma or and adenoma antigen, so-called C14, turned out to be the Lewis Y sequence. Uh, but we observed in the results section that there was uh, binding to blood group O, red cells, and even more strongly to granulocytes than with erythrocytes, this antigen. So what was going on? Well, I should say that this was to be looked at later. But, uh, you know, after all these antibodies, nature was really not interested in publishing any of them. They declined, but they invited me to write an article on their significance. It took me two years, and my, in my article in Nature, I said that the hybridoma antibodies that would reveal, the hope that they would reveal unique cell surface antigens during embryonesis and differentiation that hope has been replaced by realizing that such antigens are mainly carbohydrates of glycoproteins and glycolipids occurring in many cell types. So I suggested that this may reflect the limitations of the methods of selection of the antibodies or may point to important roles for the diverse changing carbohydrate structures as ligands, I should have said, for regulators of cell growth and differentiation. So, of course, the interest was of the roles of glycans and their recognition by endogenous lectins. What were they? Were they? What were their roles? And, of course, it, it will be no surprise uh, that we became interested in the beta galactoside binding proteins, the galactins, since the late 1970s. We showed that Galactin-1 recognizes rec the eye antigens. Great interests. 
we speculated with Bob Childs. You know, here's a diagram of the speculation, the hypothetical network based on oligosaccharide leptin cis interactions as a means of coupling of different glycoprotein receptors. And glycoproteins with like carbohydrate structures would be linked by appropriate lectins, like proteins and glycolipids. In addition, the linkage of glycoconjugates with different carbohydrate structures would be achieved through intermediates involving lectins of different binding specificities. And if the lectins were no longer expressed or the glycans change, such, network, such networks should break up, would break up. Tragically, uh, functional studies with collectin one were unfruitful. Gabby notes, as we now know, we did not use activated cells as targets. But there was a consolation some years later. Crystals of galactin-1 dimers that we obtained together with Born in 1994, the crystals bound to complex biantenary glycan in, and form infinite chains of lectin dimers cross-linked through N-acetyl-lactosaminic. So in vitro, at least, we observed such uh, links, chains of the cross-link structures. But back to glycan recognition, a visit to mycoplasma pneumonia, of course. I'm showing now the result of a PhD thesis of one of my first graduate students, Leslie Loons. In this study, which involved collaborations with well-known and eminent scientists, many enzymes were lent to us, glycoproteins, and so on and so forth, we established that the mycoplasma uses as its attachment site, the I antigen capped with sialic acid, with two three-linked sialic acid. And here it is shown, depicted, and it could bind also to the linear chains. And we showed moreover that the structures, the I and the small I antigens were found on the ciliated bronchial epithelium. Here it is. After desilation of the epithelium, more appears. The same with little i, anti-little i. After desilation, more appears. And the VIM2 antigen we had characterized by then, which was sialic acid 2 ring linked to an internally fucosylated structure present on the bronchus, but disappeared after neuraminidase. So lovely, but these were really very expensive experiments. There was indeed a need for a micro method to assign glycans as recognition structures. Many a discussion I had with Ed Lee, what to conjugate the glycans to, to in order to be able to probe them for recognition for binding. Well, we were aware at that time of the work of John Magnani, who had used glycolipids to, on chromatograms to be able to do binding studies with recognition proteins like toxics. So in 85, we designed the near glycolipid technology to address the need for a micro method to be able to carry out direct binding studies with glycans. And here is uh, the original diagram. The, the uh, glycans from diverse sources would each be conjugated to a lipid molecule to have neoglycolipids, which could be chromatogram probed with antibodies or lectins and bound elements assessed, analyzed by mass spectrometry. And this turns out to be the 
glycan, the procedure of glycan microarray technologies. The advantage of the technology was that it was applicable to minute amounts of starting oligosaccharides, to glycolipids and their glycans, and the, we had the flexibility to clinch the role of the carbohydrate and the ceramide, and had provision for generating designer arrays from targeted sources, and in a liposomal formulation, it behaved as tri, uh, planar membranes. They could also be incorporated into live cells for biological, assessing the biological relevance of bound glycans in the binding data. Initially, we used the DHPE the, uh, to reduce uh, this uh, agent to uh, using reductive amination and then later Yan Liu developed the oxime ligation method where a considerable proportion of the core monosaccharides were, are ring closed. Well, we ended on charted territory here. We ended it a while back, but the rest to come is modern history. These are contributions to assignments of glycans as recognition structures during 85 to 2002, before the glycan array signs. I want to briefly highlight three of these observations. First is the discovery of two and two six-linked O-malazole glycans, o rather than o -galmax. And They were carriers and they were indeed the sole carriers of the HNK1 antigen on glycoproteins. And later, the high prevalence of these in the brain was recorded by Chai in our group. 30% of old glycans in the brain are of this category. And the second example was the uh, discovery of sulfated ligands for E selectin by what we call the designer array. And this is derived neoglycolipids from an epithelial O glycome. Mass spec revealed three sulfur Lewis A, three sulfur Lewis X tetrasaccharides as ligands for E selectin. So at this time, Peter Lachman, an MRC board member, said, Why don't you study co uh, conglutinin? It's the first carbohydrate binding protein of animals. And actually, it is a C-type lectin in the bovine immune system. And Peter provided conglutinin. And it turns out that conglutinin, which well, actually it was known that conglutinin binds to the complement glycoprotein IC3B, which is generated by proteolysis of the complement component C3 in the complement cascade. It does not bind to the C3. However, as shown here, when the pieces are clipped off, peptides clipped off, shown in yellow, to form the IC3B binding occurs. And there are only two glycans that are used. One is here in black. Now it becomes red because it is bound by conglutinin. And we showed that those bound sites is, consists of mannose 8 and mannose 9, high mannose chains, not available in the intact glycoprotein. So the principle established from this study was number one, that the profound influence of the polypeptide chain is present. For, I will repeat my sentence. There's a profound influence of polypeptide on carbohydrate presentation for recognition. And the second point is that biological specificities may be mediated within specific body compartments through recognition of commonly occurring carbohydrate chains. And in a follow-up NMR study using RNAs B as a model, 
we concluded that the differing bioactivity of the end glycan is a reflection of the existence of different geometries of presentation of the carbohydrate determinant in relation to the protein surface within the glycan carrier protein ensemble. In 202, with CHAI, we introduced glycan arrays based on the glycan NGL technology. And I want to do a pathway of the development of this from the point I started, the neoglycolipid technology coupled with their spectrometry and as with Alex and Chai, discovery of the ether selectin ligand by this means, fluorescent NGLs with Mark Stoll, um, proof of concept with Chai and Fukui, and then the establishment of a state of the art system uh, with my colleagues here, and also development of the oxygen linked. And now, uh, we have an array of around a thousand lift link saccharide probes sequence defined, and also the ability to make arrays from natural sources. And the actual non covalent immobilization is an advantage, we believe, clustered presentation and element of mobility. I've chosen four examples to highlight of the assignments. Dectin 1 is uh, assigned. As, which is an innate immune receptor towards fungi, recognizes um, uh, requires, requires a minimum of 10 beta 1 3 linked glucans for binding. Melectin requires two glucoses on high mannose, glucose 2, high mannose N glycan on the endoplasmic reticulum for recognition. And then I want to turn to the and I, acknowledgements are here. Then I want to turn to highlights from the pandemic, where with eminent colleagues and the group, we established a three-linked, silo two three-linked avian type uh, structures are bound by the pandemic in addition to the two six link. And thank goodness that uh, agent subsided and did not progress to be a, an avian type. Uh, virus. Um, then there was the elusive prostate cancer antigen, F77, that was assigned. So arrays are almost 20 years old. They've become essential tools in unraveling protein carbohydrate interactions. And apart from uh, large resources, those of CFG, Imperial and Seabergers and others, they've gained momentum in many labs. And an international repository is being made, supported by the NIH Glygen Initiative. And a new carbohydrate software tool is being established by UK Akone with Ranzinger as a means of presentation, processing, storage, which of the glycan ray data will serve as a vehicle for uploading and downloading of data from Glycan Microarray Repository. And the facility is a, um, a micro a facility at Imperial is supported by Wellcome Trust and where we offer screening uh, analyses and collaborative research to the international scientific community uh, led by Ian Leo. And the assignments are summarized here over the years, effective agents being a very large uh, number of assignments, apart from endogenous and, uh, antibody, um, endogenous ligands, broadly uh, um, neutralizing antibodies and so on. So I come to designer arrays and beam search arrays now, which obviously will be the way forward to discover ligands in their natural environments. And the beam search approach I want to mention illustrated with kind help of um, Jin Yu in the group 
old light cans, for example, for a mucina generated, made into NGLs, fractionated, made into a primary array. Then a secondary array is made based on selected from the bound elements through a tertiary array to, in order to isolate and sequence the reagents and the, the glycans. And this is an example where a, a, a ligand type 1 based H structure was assigned on a porcine stomach mucin. Type 1 based, this has not been described on this glycoprotein at all. Usually that what has been found is type 2. So this is among hundreds, hundreds of uh, glycans that are found on this mucin, a minor component that the virus binds to. So the significance is that the approach is orders of magnitude more sensitive than the traditional methods, identifying components extremely minor, unsuspected in the glycome. And what I want to say, we don't forget about the sequence defined because they are highly compatible, complementary, because they also help to reveal unsuspected structures that are represented in different physiological contexts. So well, I believe this approach paves the way to O-glycome recognition in a wide range of settings. So finally, glycans of the host as genetic determinants of infection and predisposition to preterm birth. Uncharted? Well, this is our current program, March of Dimes supported, to determine structures of glycan ligands for pathogenic and commercial microbiota in the lower reproductive tract. And uh, I will say, watch this page. And great thanks are due to Phil Bennett for having us in the Department of Metabolism, Digestion and Reproduction. And I acknowledge all my colleagues past and present in the Glycosciences Laboratory.